14th, Napoleon sent for me to give me an audience prior to my departure, during which he declined receiving any more medical advice for me in the situation in which I was placed by Sir Hudson Lowe, and addressed me in the following words, Eh bien, docteur, vous allez nous quitter, le monde conservera-t-il quand on a eu la lâcheté de tenter un mon médecin Puisque vous êtes un simple lieutenant, soumis à tout l'arbitraire et à la discipline militaire, vous n'avez plus d'indépendance nécessaire pour que vos secours puissent être utiles. Je vous remercie de vos soins qui sera le plus tôt possible. Ce sujet de ténèbres et de crimes, j'aimerais sur ces rabats rangés de maladies et sans secours, mais votre nation en sera déshonorée à jamais. He then bade me adieu. Here's a translation. Well, doctor, you're going to quit us. Will the world conceive that they have been base enough to make attempts upon my physician? Since you are no more than a simple lieutenant subjected to arbitrary power and to military discipline, you have no longer the independence necessary to render your services useful to me. I thank you for your care. Quit as soon as you can this abode of darkness and of crime. I shall expire upon that pallet, consumed by disease and without any assistance, but your country will be eternally dishonored by my death. May 9th. Sir Hudson Lowe, finding that he could not succeed in his plan of establishing another surgeon with Napoleon, and that the latter was determined not to receive him, and having been made to comprehend by the commissioners that if Napoleon died while he kept me in confinement, without bringing me to a trial or even preferring any charge against me, or under the hands of any surgeon forced upon him, strange surmises would arise in England and in Europe respecting his death, of which they themselves should be unable to render a satisfactory explanation, decided upon removing the restrictions he had imposed upon me. Accordingly, he released me after having kept me in confinement 27 days, during which time I was successively assailed in correspondence by all his staff. And in order to ensnare me, frequently required to return by a dragoon who waited answers to letters composed after several days reflection by the united wisdom of sir hudson lowe and his staff as this correspondence has been already before the public i shall not now trouble the reader with it in the letter containing the order for my release his excellency felt himself obliged to acknowledge me as napoleon's private surgeon a point which he had contested before. A dispatch sent by Sir Hudson Lowe to Longwood containing some extract from a correspondence of Lord Bathurst stating, amongst other matters, that permission would be given that a list of persons not exceeding 50 in number resident on the island should be drawn up by Count Bertrand and submitted to the governor for approval and that such persons should be admitted to Longwood at seasonable hours with no other pass than the invitation of General Bonaparte, it being understood that they were on such occasions to deliver their invitations with their names as vouchers at the barrier, it being clearly understood that the governor was to reserve a discretionary power to erase from the list any individuals to whom he might consider it inexpedient to continue with such facility of access. Tenth, previous to allowing me to resume my medical functions at Longwood Napoleon, in order to put a stop to the fabrication of any more bulletins, required that I should make out a report of the state of his health once a week, or oftener than necessary. A copy of which should be given to the governor if he required it. This I immediately communicated to Sir Hudson Lowe, who not only did not require it, but absolutely prohibited me from making him, Sir Hudson, any written report. Napoleon's state of health had become worse since last month. The pain was more constant and severe. Considerable indignation was excited in the island at the conduct which had been pursued towards Napoleon. 16th, a proclamation issued by Sir Hudson Lowe and placarded in the most conspicuous manner, interdicting all officers, inhabitants, or other persons whatsoever from holding any correspondence or communication with the foreign persons under detention on it, 
18th. Captain Blakeney ordered by Sir Hudson Lowe to assemble all the English servants at Longwood and read to them the proclamation of the 16th. This was done without notice being given to their masters. Napoleon, when informed of this, ordered that the English servants employed at Longwood in place of Santini and others sent away by Sir Hudson Lowe should be discharged. 20th. Had some conversation with the emperor upon the work published by Mr. Ellis on the embassy to China and the conversation at Longwood, which that gentleman had published. Napoleon observed that having learned that Mr. Ellis had been secretary to a mission to Persia, a short time after General Gardon had quit, quitted Espahan, and he had questioned him to the progress that Russia had made on the Persian side, I told him, added Napoleon, that if Russia succeeded in attaching the brave Polish nation to her, she would no longer have a rival because she would restrain England by menacing the latter's possessions in India and Austria by the great moral superiority of her troops and by the followers of the Greek church who are so numerous in Hungary and Galicia. And that appearance has rendered it probable that a Greek patriarch would one day officiate in Sancta Sophia. I also mentioned to him that if England adopted the system of founding her power upon her land force and on maintaining armies on the continent, those armies would mask her real forces, and she would commit the same fault that Francis I was guilty of at the Battle of Pavia by placing himself with the elite of his cavalry before a formidable battery, which would have assured him the victory had he not prevented it from firing by masking it. I told him that your riots in England signified nothing and that your constables were sufficient to reestablish order. If, at the same time, your ministers directed all their attention and care towards the amelioration of the administration to the prosperity of your manufacturers and your commerce, that above all, you must not be ashamed of being merchants. From that source, your real power springs. But that if the misery was real, as asserted by Lord Wellesley, and was caused by the two great efforts made by England during 20 years, in that case, two violent measures employed upon the mass of the people would be topical applications likely to produce madness in them. I said that you have amongst you men too wise not too open at the same time that they applied these violent remedies channels which would discharge the acrimonious humors, restore health and ease to the people and cause misery to disappear. During all the conversations I had with Mr. Ellis continued he, which lasted about half of an hour, not one word was said about St. Helena. Count Montsalon had no conversation on the subject with Mr. Ellis, or any other of the legation. Mr. Ellis made no inquiries on this spot, never visited the interior of the establishment, knew nothing, saw nothing, and heard nothing about it, at least from the French. And yet in his work, he has the impudence to play the part of a judge who had heard the complaining parties on this spot, but that passage has not been written by his hand. It is the invention of some... Comey to Lord Bathurst, who has imposed the insertion of it upon him. Such a prostitution of his name reflects but little credit upon that diplomatic character. He made some observations upon the contrast between the governor's proclamation and conduct and the dispatches sent by Lord Bathurst, and that the dispatch was merely got up to have the appearance of doing something to benefit his situation, while in reality nothing was done. In the course of the conversation, Napoleon observed that but little reliance was to be placed on the writings of a man informing a judgment of his private character or conduct, which he illustrated by informing me that Bernadette Saint-Pierre, whose writings were so sentimentally beautiful and breathing principles of humanity and social happiness in every page, was one of the worst private characters in France, June 7th. The Mangles' store ship arrived, 11th, with the exception of the painful inflammatory affection of the cheeks, the so frequent recurrence of which has been prevented by the extraction of two more teeth. Napoleon's state of health has become much worse. He accordingly consented on this day to adopt the practice recommended to him, which was consequently commenced on this day. He has been confined almost entirely to his apartments for nearly six weeks.